couple more minutes. So we'll all just hang tight, uh, grab your cup of coffee. Uh, we'll come back at, uh, give everybody a couple minutes. So I'll, I'll check in at 10 o'clock and then um, see how we're doing, but um, got a couple minutes left. So enjoy your freedom for now. <laughs> Um, you've got a, probably another minute or two if you need to situate yourself. But good morning, and I'm glad you're here.
started and um, anybody else who joins after can watch the recording. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, depending on where you are, it may or may not be sunny and may or may not be 50 degrees. So I hope you are having a good morning wherever you are. Um, this particular webinar came out of you know, I get a lot of questions from people that are kind of random and one off, but I feel like there are lots of people who might have these questions. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is our topics that I've talked about before. Some of it is new. Hopefully you'll learn something today. Um, if you have been on this webinar before, you will probably recognize this slide. Um, my name is Jen Pollack. I am the director of I-9. Um, services at Paragon in addition to a couple other things that I do there. And uh, I've been in the I-9 world for a very long time. It always seems uh, shorter, but it's really been probably 10, 15 years that I've been doing this. So lots of changes, lots of new things that keep coming up. So I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about those changes, about some of the things to watch out for, especially in the times of the pandemic and COVID procedures and all that stuff. So. Um, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, please do find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with you, chat with you. I post relatively frequently about I-9 topics as well as some of the other stuff that Paragon does. So uh, you might actually find some useful information in there. I did want to give a quick disclaimer that things we talk about today do not constitute legal advice. Um, I do have <laughs> lawyer references for you if you do have some specific legal needs that you need help with. Uh, but just want you to uh, to know about that. So again, if you've been on one of these before, you're going to ace this quiz, but I thought I would start off our day with a quick quiz about I-9s. So true or false, employment eligibility verification is, quite, is required for people hired prior to November 7th, 1986. No one will know your answer, so you just say it out loud or keep it to yourself think about it. The answer is false. That's kind of a trick question. It's actually not required for people hired prior to November 6th, 1986. That is when the regulation came into effect. True or false. If the employee's work authorization document has an expiration date, the employer must re-verify the employee's right to work prior to that expiration date. Kind of a mouthful there, but I'll give you a second. The answer is true. So this is particularly relevant to people who are here on uh, work visas or who have an employment authorization document and there's an expiration date on that. Next question. Reverification is not necessary for which of the following? U.S. citizens, permanent residents, expired list B documents, or all of the above? As a reminder, our list B document is one that establishes identity. Driver's license, um, that's the most popular one. Correct answer is D, all of the above. So go back and look at that. If somebody comes to you and who's a US citizen and their passport expires, you don't have to do anything with it or any of their documents. Any permanent residents don't have to be re-verified even if their permanent resident card expires. And list B document, if somebody comes to you and they've got a valid driver's license on January 1st and it expires three months later, you don't have to do anything. True or false, an employer may be subject to fines, six months imprisonment or both, if found to have engaged in a pattern or practice of knowingly hiring unauthorized aliens. That's probably not such a trick question, the, the answer is true. Um, unauthorized aliens is a term of art. It is not a term I like to normally use, uh, but someone who is not work authorized. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of the fines and things that happen to people who uh, do that. Last but not least, the, an employee must complete section one of the I-9 form no later than the third day of employment, within eight business days of accepting a job offer, the first day of work, or none of the above. And this should say the first day of work for pay. The answer is C. And that is one that trips people up a lot um, because there's different 
rules for the employee and the employer about when they need to complete their portion of the I-9. Um, the employee can actually complete it uh, as soon as they've been offered and accepted a job. So it doesn't have to be on day one, but it cannot be later than day one. So how did you do? <laughs> um, I hope because you're here, you, you aced it because you've heard this quiz before and because you're a, an expert in I-9s. But if you didn't, that's okay. Um, those are very common mistakes, common errors, common issues that people have. So that's why, uh, that's why I start with those. So just very quickly, as we all know, the I-9 is used for verifying the identity and employment authorization of individuals hired for employment in the United States. It's a mouthful, but basically that's just to say everybody, uh, every company who has one or more employees must have an I-9 on file for current employees uh, who are hired after <laughs> November 6, 1986. Uh, so that includes the CEO. That includes... Um, your cousin, your grandma, even if you know who they are, you still have to complete a 99. What else besides um, preventing employers from hiring unauthorized workers, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, also called IRCA, uh, established prohibitions against national origin and citizenship and immigration status discrimination. So you, th this is probably the side of the I-9 that people aren't that familiar with um, because it's not, it doesn't always come up in your day-to-day -day completing I-9 or re-verifying or something like that. So these are just some examples of what is considered discrimination. And I'll tell you a little bit about each. Over-documentation on the I-9 is considered discrimination. The reason for that is because if you have a particular class of people um, who you are, um, requesting additional documents for, that could be seen as um, citizenship discrimination, um, especially as to the second point, requesting specific documents from specific classes of people, especially if it's done intentionally. One of the um, easiest things that people do incorrectly is if someone indicates um, on section one that they are a permanent resident, then an, an employer would require them to show a copy of their permanent resident card. That is not only illegal, it is discrimination against permanent residents. A permanent resident does not have to show you their um, permanent resident card, their green card. They can show you any combination of documents that prove their work, out, or work authorization and identity. So um, if you're doing that, please don't. <laughs> uh, and then uh, another um, example is refusing to hire anyone except a US citizen. Unless you are required by your federal contract to only hire U.S. citizens, uh, that's a big no-no. Um, if someone can prove to you that they are um, eligible to work in the United States, then you cannot refuse to um, hire them if they are not a U.S. citizen. So why do we really care about the I-9? Uh, not only, you know, just because we have to, uh, it's a law. Um, and you don't, I know you don't mail it anywhere. Nobody ever sees it really. So why do we care? Well, the government cares and industry averages indicate 76% of any organization's I-9s contain at least one error. Excuse me. An average penalty is about $1,800. So if you have one harmless error on, a, on each form, you, when let's say your organization has 250 employees, that's a, a small to medium sized business. Um, that's you're looking at potentially a $500,000 fine. Not having an I-9 on file is even worse. So one of the things that I talk to people about when they're trying to assess their risk and assess their what their penalty could be, the first thing I tell people to do, go through your forms and make sure you have um, a form on file for everybody who currently works for you. There's also the retention rule that people have to pay attention to. So I won't go into that right now, but at least you have to have a form for everybody that's working for you right now. It could be part-time, it could be an intern, it could be full-time, whatever it is. Anytime you pay somebody money, you have to have an I-9 on file for them. So what are some common errors? I'm sure you've, in your practice, seen a lot more than these, but forgetting to input a birth date or write your birth date on the form. It's pretty basic, but you, you know, it's a form with a lot of little spots to go over. So you, um, there's lots of spots to miss. Another um, 
mistake people make a lot is, you know, you're filling out forms, it's your first day, you're used to writing the current date, people would put in the current date for their birth date, and obviously that would be incorrect. Um, failure to sign or date a form is a big error. Uh, having a missing address in the, of the employer in section two or using incorrect documents. One thing I did want to mention about this, um, sorry, over documentation here. As often happens, employees don't really know what documents they're bringing you, so they kind of bring you everything in the kitchen sink. If they give you a passport, their driver's license, and their social security card, and you write all of them on the form, that's considered over documentation. It might seem like a great idea because, hey, they gave me all this. I'm going to use all of this and more is better. That's not the case in the I-9. In that situation, you need to tell somebody, you know, please choose which documents uh, you're going to give me. So, and you know that audits are on the rise. Um, historically, ICE has concentrated their efforts on sort of the, you know, the, the ones you hear in the news about um, manufacturing companies and seasonal workforces and things like that. But um, recent indications from ICE have said that, you know, really anybody can be a target. They do concentrate on critical infrastructure. Um, so nuclear power plants, things like that right now. Um, but they, they're, no one is immune to it. Um, it's kind of a, depending on what kind of tips they have, depending on what kind of information they have, uh, they are non-denominational when it comes to who they're going to audit. And we really don't see that changing anytime soon. And they, you know, but besides saying who they're auditing right now, um, they don't, they don't publish a list of, well, you could be next. So <laughs> you could be next. <clears throat> Before I go over some of it, just a couple of short cases, I wanted to mention that last week, ICE actually put out a new memo from the acting uh, director of Homeland Security saying that they are de-emphasizing all of these crazy big raids that we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, which is good and bad. Um, it's a shift from the prior administration's focus, but that doesn't mean that they're not doing um, not doing raids anymore. And it certainly doesn't mean that they're doing I-9 audits because don't forget that every single one of those raids you've read about in the news, each one started with an I-9 audit. So um, <laughs> just because you might not see the news doesn't mean that those are, aren't happening. So the, the first two cases I'm gonna mention, I'm only going to go over three. The first two I'm gonna mention are really cases that on the surface don't seem like they're that big of a deal but really they highlight that it's not just hiring unauthorized workers that can get you into trouble. So $45,000 is not um, small change, but <clears throat> so the office of the chief administrating, administrative hearing officer is the sort of high court responsible for specific cases involving allegations of the hiring and employment of unauthorized workers. So this particular penalty was based on a discovery from an I-9 audit that the employer failed to sign section two in the employer attestation in 100% of its forms. The, uh, the theory behind that, or the reason that that's a big deal is because if that's not signed, you've basically not even done the form. Um, it's basically saying, I, when you sign the form, you're saying that you attest under penalty of perjury, that you've reviewed the documents and they appear to be genuine and relate to the person that presented to them. If you don't sign that, you're not doing your part. So the employer may as well not have even completed it. Um, and that was on 25 forms. <clears throat> it was further found during that audit that on nearly 70% of the forms, the employee did not attest to his or her authorization to work in the United States. So that is also like the employee just didn't do it. The penalty also covered one employee who was found to be unauthorized to work in the United States and presented false documents during the I-9 process. Um, and the employer was alerted to that and they continued to employ them. So that is the, the first case that is not just willfully hiring unauthorized workers, which is what the media wants to you think employers are doing. The second case is um, a, sort of similar, but um, two concrete companies, sister companies, uh, they're relatively small con um, decorative concrete and paving companies. They employ around 75 people total. The fine was based on several counts. The first was a failure to present the Form I-9 during an audit. So when ICE comes in and they request the forms, they just didn't. <laughs> uh, 
um, failure to ensure section one, the employee section was completed properly. Failure on the part of the employer to complete section two and or three. Section three is the re-verification section and also substantive paperwork violations. There's a difference. There's technical violations and there are substantive violations. Technical violations are things like you forgot to uh, put an apartment number or put NA or something like that. Substantive are the things like you didn't uh, attest to citizenship, you didn't sign the form, things like that. Uh, so we got a total of $16,825 for just improper I-9 completion. And with a company that employs under 75 people, um, I don't think they have that budget line for $16,000 fine. Now, this is my favorite. And like I said, if you've been with me before, <laughs> I always like to close with this one because it's so dramatic. So Asplund Tree Company is um, a tree trimming and brush clearance company. They work around gas and power lines. Um, I've seen several of them around here lately with winds and things like that. So basically, they're just they're, they do a lot of government contracts. And um, they're a very, very large company. So this was a six-year investigation that, again, began with an I-9 audit in 2009. During the investigation, it was found that the company employed unauthorized workers who were then fired once they were discovered. Then the company created a decentralized hiring process to leave out the very top management. Hiring was by word of mouth referrals, not by any particular application process. The crews were highly motivated and easily mobilized, allowing the employee, the, uh, the company to dominate the market. So they would, they would hire unauthorized workers, they would be found out, they would fire them and then hire them through other means and not let anybody know. This particular fine represents the highest amount ever levied in an immigration case and was largely due to this knowingly hiring unauthorized workers and conspiring at the highest levels to do so. This is the big number, $95 million, $95 million. $80 million of the 95 was a criminal judgment uh, against the, cons the conspirers, um, I'm sorry, against the company. And then the remaining 15 million was in civil penalties. So when you sign an I-9, um, you are not only signing on behalf of the company, but you are also signing on behalf of yourself. Um, if you are in a situation where you are told by management, by uh, another person, uh, that you must do something that you know is incorrect and you do it, um, that can be a big problem for you in the end. Yes, Brian, that is a lot of money. $95 million. And, you know, it, uh, when you compare it to the other ones, you know, 16000 45000 it's like, wow, that's really huge. But Athland is a gigantic company and they were really um, obviously doing things very, very wrong. And the government really was trying to make a, a, an example out of them. And that kind of kicked off a lot of different raids. I'm not going to go over them, but various, um, various large raids have happened over the last uh, five to six years. So let's get going for some more kind of random things that we want to talk about. And if you do have any questions, please put it in the uh, this little chat window on the side. I'll, if I can't answer them now, I will make sure to jot it down and uh, get get back to you. So the most recent thing that you hopefully all know about is this virtual I-9 completion rule due to COVID. So the exciting news is that you can review Section 2 documents via video. The caveat here is that you have to be a fully remote workforce. This has been something that people have sort of been bending the rules on a little bit. Um, and I say that generously, a lot of people have been bending this rule. If your entire organization is fully remote, and it's not always fully remote, then you are allowed to use this rule. It doesn't work if some of the people are in the office and HR hasn't come back yet. Or if the CEO is not comfortable being in the office, you can still use the virtual verification rules. That's not the case. You must be fully remote due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, once you're back in the office, you have to review the documents in person within three days of returning. That is a giant mess for a lot of people. Um, it's basically um, like following the initial I-9 rules that you have to verify everybody's documents within three days of their employment. Uh, I think the government understands that this isn't really going to happen in three days. 
they're never going to say that. That is me opining on what, what they're conscious of. Um, so if you have anybody that was, that you verified doing, do, during COVID uh, via virtual verifications, I would start doing the in-person stuff now, if you can, if you're actually in the office, um, because I, they've, they've extended this started March 18th of 2020. They've extended it initially every month. And then as everybody knew, we weren't going back to the office, uh, they started doing it a couple months in. So currently in place until December 31st. I thought it well, they weren't going to extend it after August 31st. I really don't think they're going to extend it after December 31st. That could change. Uh, but if you have any possibility to do that now, if you, if you even have five people that you need to do this for, it's not going to be um, a quick a quick thing. Do you have an example of how to review and document on the I nine? I don't have it in this one, Jill, but I will. I'll get that to you. Uh, USCIS miraculously has very <laughs> specific instructions on how to do this, and actually pictures on how to do that. So I'll make sure to get that out to everybody. And related to um, to the virtual I-9 completion, what legal challenges do you foresee for organizations moving towards a hybrid model or for those going 100% remote? So this is an interesting topic because I think a lot of organizations are going to be in this hybrid model where it's like, well, you know, kind of leave it up to people however they want. So the, the legal challenges are that you're going to fall out of compliance if you were used to doing something in person and now you've got this remote hybrid model. Um, so that's the biggest, the biggest legal challenge is that you'll just fall out of compliance. Um, related to that is a loss of chain in command. Um, if, if I at headquarters was always responsible for, you know, seeing the people on day one and doing their I-9, um, and now I work virtually, well, how am I going to do that? We're going to need to figure out who's in charge of that now. And then also losing I-9. So let's say you've got some people in one office, some people in another, you've got uh, Brian doing it in New York, and I've got Jill doing it in California. Where do they go? So that's that's another challenge um, because if you're put through an audit and you don't have a form as discussed, um, that's a big deal. What do you think the best way to handle I-9s for remote workforce other than the already available option of the authorized representative? So if you're not familiar with the authorized representative method, Basically, the company can appoint anybody in the entire country <laughs> that they want to, to complete Section 2 on, on their behalf. So if you're an employee, let's say you're used to having remote employees and you send off some instructions to somebody, you say, hey, go find a Starbucks barista and ask them to complete this I-9 on your, on your behalf, on behalf of the employer. That's totally legal. Um, they would sign it, you know, their name, authorized representative of XYZ company, um, but then that you're still liable for that. So the best, the best way to handle this is to have an electronic I-9 vendor who has a remote network of Section 2 completers. There are several large organizations, there are several small organizations that do this, um, but to have that system, so basically it's a fully electronic system that then allows the employee to schedule the Section 2 completion on their own time. When it comes to the returning workforce for those who had completed the I-9 via virtual verification during the pandemic, what's the best strategy? Uh, and I kind of touched on this before, but very specifically, you're going to need to set up very specific plans and protocols for your team to do this. Um, authorized employees will need to have plans and pictures drawn out so they know what they're doing. Because with an authorized representative who's doing this random one-off um, virtual verification, re-verification, like that's not their job. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. So they're going to need very specific um, instructions on how to do it. Another option that's definitely more costly, but might contain the problem a little bit more is planning days where uh, the people in the field come to the closest office or closest location, or somebody from headquarters or HR goes to centrally located spots to have like a verification fair. Um, those are not ideal situations. And like I said, they are costly, but to be fully in compliance and to really contain that problem and maintain your chain of command, like I was talking about, um, that that is definitely an option.
So in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, hold on. Aware of within an applicant tracking system or an HRIS when it comes to I-9s and things to look out for, especially with the remote I-9s. One of the biggest challenges that I see and that also ICE sees is um, any sort of homegrown system or HRIS that stores um, I-9s electronically is most don't actually meet the regulations for electronic storage. So I'm going to go over a little bit of the, the, the rules about electronic storage. Lots of the fines that ICE is levying lately is, are due to improper electronic systems. So here they are, and I will read them. I know you can read, but I'm going to read them as well. Reasonable controls to ensure the system's integrity. Reasonable controls designed to prevent and detect unauthorized or additional accidental creation alteration to the Form I-9, including the electronic signature. An inspection and quality assurance program that regularly evaluates the system and includes periodic checks. That's difficult. An indexing system that allows users to identify and retrieve records maintained in the system. And lastly, the ability to reproduce legible and readable paper copies. Uh, the biggest thing here <clears throat> that trips people up is that they think I can scan a PDF of my I-9, save it, destroy the paper copy, and I'm good. Maybe you have a very robust PDF storage system, but that is generally not acceptable. Because once you have the PDF, if you're literally just storing literally that PDF image, there's no way to detect um, who can um, look at it, who can alter it. Uh, anything like that. So looking at two and three there. And electronically, you can use one or more electronic generation or storage systems as long as any form retained in the system remains fully accessible and meets the regulations. You can change systems. Uh, as long as the new system continues to meet regulatory performance requirements. So that means if you had an old system and you're going to switch to a new one, you can still have two. Um, but for each electronic system you use, you have to maintain and make available upon request complete descriptions of the system, including all procedures relating to its use, and the indexing system that identifies and retrieves relevant documents and records. The indexing system is really the the linchpin here in the electronic storage, um, which is why a lot of them fail. I would encourage you to, if you're using um, a payroll provider or if you're using another system that has a built-in I-9 component, I would encourage you when we get off this webinar to talk to your person uh, to find out how they're meeting the, 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 uh, ICE, uh, the USCIS regulations on electronic storage. Many of them are, not all of them are. If they're not, I would consider finding a new vendor or requesting that they change their um, procedures. I don't know how effective that would be, but you can ask. So how much notice, this is, these are, these, like I said, some of these are questions from clients. How much notice does ICE give you that they're going to be, aud that you're going to be audited? None, zero days. They will never tell you that they're coming. Um, Generally, they'll come, usually two or three officers will come. They're, they're not wearing like hazmat suits. They're not wearing big old vests, but they do come armed. Ice, ICE agents are armed. So it's, it's not a fun situation to be in. It's rather stressful um, and you get no, no, no notice. So better be prepared. So we have a sizable, this is a question from a client, we have a sizable union workforce and there are times that during an internal audit, their I-9 cannot be found. When asked to complete a new one, the union instructs their members not to do so. What can we do in the event that ICE comes and we do not have one to prevent to present? So without really getting into the weeds about unions and bargaining and all that stuff, the short answer is that if you're missing an I-9, you will be fined. That is not... <laughs> the end of the answer. The end of the answer is you should also talk to a labor attorney who can help you with the union question specifically. Um, unions are a whole other beast and there are specific bargaining requirements and things. So like, I'm not saying what they did was wrong or right, um, but it is not as simple as they just have to let you do it. 
Rosemary asks, how long do I-9s have to be kept for employees who no longer work with the company? Excellent question. Um, for the retention rules for I-9s are that you must retain the I-9 for one year after the date of departure or three years from date of hire, whichever is later. So one year from the date of termination or three years from the date that they were hired. Always whichever is longer. And I always encourage people to have a, have a list of those dates. Store the I-9s in a folder by date of when they can be destroyed because if you don't destroy them and you're audited, um, they can be part of the record. And if there are errors on those, um, you want to get rid of <laughs> any errors you might have. Can one person check the physical documents in another complete section too? No, 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 no. Please do not do this. People have gotten large fines based on doing this. Whoever reviews the documents must also sign and complete section two. So I remember when you're signing, set, when you complete section two, you're saying, this person gave me these documents and now I am signing to say that they look like the person and they appear to be genuine. That's what you're doing when you're signing the section two. If you are reviewing copies that somebody else has sent you and they looked at the physical documents, um, that is not right. <laughs> because you would be signing and saying you saw something that you didn't. What do I do if I-9s in a merger? So this may or may not be coming up for some of you as the year end comes along, but <clears throat> so there are two options and two options only for um, in the case of a merger and acquisition and the same policy has to apply across the board for your organization when you're in that particular deal. You can either continue the employment of the acquired employees and take along all the I-9s. Uh, the surviving company assumes liability for errors as well as re-verification requirements. Your other option is to treat acquired employees as new hires, uh, also known as complete a new I-9 for all of them. I've seen both done. It really depends on how bad the forms are that you're taking on or how many new employees are coming on board. Uh, if you do have an electronic system, it might be just as easy to redo all of their I-9s. Um, but you should at least have a look at um, a good portion or a representative sample of the I-9s from the old company so that you know what you're getting into. Can my employee leave any part of Section 1 on Form I-9 blank? When is an employee required to use NA in Section 1? So no, <laughs> you can't leave part, the only parts blank you can leave are the um, email address. So employees have to complete every applicable field in section one with the exception of telephone, email, and social security number. Side note, a social security number is only required to be written on the form or entered into the form if you use electronic, if the employee, if the employer participates in e-verify. Lots of people just put it on there because they're used to doing it and it's not actually wrong if you're not an e-verified employer. Um, the required fields, anything other than that, must be completed with either the information requested or NA. That includes things like um, for la other names used. So you know, in the on section one, you put your first, your last name, your first name, your middle name, and then other names used. If you don't have any other names used, you have to write NA. Otherwise, it's technically an error. If you don't have an apartment number, you have to write NA. Otherwise, it's technically an error. May a notary public or any authorized representative attach an attestation to Form I-9 instead of providing a signature in the signature block? No. Section 2, like I said, is a review of the documents and must be signed. If Section 2 is not signed by the individual who reviewed the documents, the I-9 is not complete. Sometimes when you are asking an authorized representative who particularly uh, happens to be a notary, they want to notarize the form. That's actually not the, the uh, manner in which they're completing the form. So uh, they, act, they need to sign it and not notarize it. Shannon asks, three years after the date of hire or one year after termination date, whichever is later. Yes, that is the, um, that is the retention rule. All right, moving on. What is my responsibility concerning the authenticity of documents presented to me? This is a 
it, it's tricky, but it's not tricky. Uh, it seems like you're required to be a document expert. You are not required to be a document expert. When you are signing the I-9 and you're reviewing somebody's documents, what you are attesting to is that the person's person who's in front of you presented documents that appear to be genuine. They don't appear to be altered. They're not copies. Uh, they look like the current form of the the document that you're looking at, they're not expired, things like that, and that they look like the person. Sometimes what will happen is uh, someone will come with uh, two documents that have different last names. And the question is, well, what do I do? They don't exactly match the name that somebody wrote on the form. Well, that happens. And if you can sort of put the puzzle together and map, match the, the three documents, the two documents with the form, and you're comfortable that, that is a, those are valid documents and that they relate to the person who gave them to you, you can use them. Um, you know, it's kind of a pain to get new documents if you change your name or if something has happened where um, you, know, you have a new document that doesn't match something else. So um, as long as you can make the case, uh, that's what you're required, that's what you're responsible to do. Um, if they don't appear to be genuine, if they don't look like the person, if they don't match up name-wise, then you need to ask the employee for new documents. And that can be awkward, um, but your, your responsibility is to make sure that they are genuine and appear to uh, relate to the person in front of you. So um, if, if their social security card looks a little goofy um, and you can't make sense of it, even if you, you, know, you look in the handbook and you say, I don't know, this just doesn't look right, um, then you need to ask the employee for new documents. And hopefully you're doing this early enough in the process so that, you know, you're not getting to the end of the three-day period and uh, you're out of time. So the earlier, the better. Talked about this a little. How far in advance can the Form I-9 be completed? It can be completed as long as the employee has been offered and accepted a role. Uh, they can complete the I-9. They can complete their section. You can complete it. You can do the whole thing. The only asterisk I put on that is if you are um, have a union workforce or if you have people who are hourly employees and you're requiring them to do um, other paperwork, you might have to pay them. So just, uh, just keep that in mind. Okay. As an employer, may I use a signature stamp? No, unfortunately, you can't. <laughs> um, both of the employer and the employee's signatures have to be what we consider wet signatures. Um, I know it's too bad because your hand can get crampy, but um, unfortunately, you have to sign it in, uh, in real, real time. Can I refuse to hire an employee whose employment authorization has an expiration date? We also talked about this earlier. No, you cannot. Um, this seems difficult because if you are an employer who does not support uh, visa applications for employees. This can be difficult because if somebody comes to you and you're ready to hire them and you get them their I-9 and their EAD expires in three months, that's tough. Um, there's a chance you probably wouldn't have even gotten to that point um, because usually folks who have expiring work authorization are gonna be pretty upfront that they need sponsorship. Um, but you cannot refuse to hire them if you find that out. If you find that out on day one, you cannot refuse to hire them except if it's for another job related reason. One of the things that may help alleviate this, and it may not, is that in your hiring process, if you have a, an applicant tracking system or if you're putting out employment applications, you can ask these two questions. You can ask, are you currently or do you in the future require, um, sorry, are you currently work, authoriz work authorized in the United States? And if the answer is no, you can ask if you will now or in the future require sponsorship. You cannot ask someone's citizenship status unless like as discussed, there are a, you have a federal contract. You cannot ask where they are from, where they are born, all of those um, discriminatory hiring practices you cannot ask to get at this question. Jill, do you recommend using E-Verify? E-Verify is coming up, so I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes. So, good question. Vijay is asking, how to handle the situation when your corporate is 100% remote, store employees are on site, certain acquired companies are using the hybrid format? That is a lot. Um, 
I think so. If I'm going to talk about your store employees, because I think that's probably um, a big issue, I would find managers at those particular sites or maybe a regional manager, if you are of that type of organization, to have them be the person that either travels to the site or to whom employees would go to have to complete the I-9. Um, acquired companies are using the hybrid format. I mean, I think if you're if you're dealing with the acquired companies and you know you're trying to bring them into the fold, if you will, um, you'll have to be specific about how they um, how they complete it. So you'll have to decide for them um, or help them decide if they're going to be going to a corporate office or if they're going to be using um, the previously mentioned way of um, you know regionally doing this. Oh, well, and the the other option is to have an electronic system that everybody just does it on their own. Uh, may I fire an employee who fails to produce the required documents within three business days of his or her start date? Yes, you actually may. Um, if someone cannot present to you documents that prove their identity and work authorization, um, you can fire them. You have to have been paying them for the days that they were working, um, but you can fire them after that. It seems wrong, but you can. <laughs> Does a state issued enhanced driver's license qualify as a list A document? No, a, um, a driver's license is a list B document, um, regardless of it being enhanced or not. And I know that's a little bit confusing because some states on, and TSA are accepting enhanced driver's licenses as a way to board a plane, uh, but you, if you, you, you can't. <laughs> a driver's license is still um, a list B document. Um, I don't, that may change, but there'd have to be certain um, regulatory changes that go into effect uh, to change that. But right now it is not a list A document. The only list A documents are passport, permanent resident cards, EADs, which are employment authorization documents, and then um, certain passport, foreign passports with uh, work authorization attached. And just as a reminder, all documents have to be unexpired. There used to be a time when you could accept a, an expired passport. That is no longer the case. All documents have to be unexpired when they are presented to you. Is an unsigned Social Security card valid? This also seems wrong, but the answer is yes. Um, so if if you got your social security card when you were six months old and you have not yet signed it, that's fine. Um, it is perfectly valid to use. I don't know if that goes for every place, but on the I-9, it is a valid document. What should I do if an employee presents a social security card marked not valid for employment, but they state that they know that they are now authorized to work? That is not an acceptable I-9 document. Um, the times that you would get a document, a, a social security card that says that um, not valid for employment, or it might say not valid without INS or USCIS authorization, um, is somebody who came to the United States as a non-immigrant um, and they are eligible to receive a social security card, but uh, they have an underlying status that means that they need to have other work authorization. So that's unfortunately not valid. They can get a new one. Uh, they can go to the Social Security office and request that they have an unrestricted Social Security card. Even if, so they can go get a new Social Security card or they can show other documents that prove that they're authorized to work. Like maybe they got a green card. They could show you that. The trick here is that you can't tell them that. They can, you can tell them they can show you other, other, other documents or they can go get an unrestricted Social Security card. All right, so here we go in E-Verify, and Jill, uh, you're not the only one that asked this, so I'll, I'll delve into a little bit more than is listed here on the slide. But first of all, does participation in E-Verify protect me from an ICE audit? No, it does not. Uh, participation in E-Verify does not provide safe harbor, but it does show a good faith effort. And what's called, um, uh, there's another term that I'm, that I'm blanking on right now, but no, it doesn't prevent you from an audit from ICE. Um, I will neither tell you yes or no to sign up for using E-Verify. What I will tell you is that um, there's, there's some things to consider. And I actually wrote a, a short article about this that I can share with you as well. Um, so 
the other question that I got about E-Verify is basically the same as Jill. So is it useful to sign up for E-Verify? I will tell you, statistically speaking, 99% of E-Verify cases come back as work authorized. Um, that means that it's a pretty solidly built system and has improved vastly from when it was first introduced. Um, if you are a, an employer who employs students, F1 students that are using the STEM OPT extension, you have to be enrolled in E-Verify. Um, that is a requirement from the government in order for that person to get an extension of their optional practical training. On the other side of that, sometimes the social security database is wrong. I know that's probably shocking to you that a government database would be wrong, but um, sometimes it's wrong. Things are keyed in incorrectly. Somebody doesn't update a name in time or properly or at all. And so that can create a bit of a, a nightmare for you. Um, E-Verify also does not detect whether valid documents have been altered. Um, so what that means is that you could be looking at a document from somebody and uh, enter it into the system. And if E-Verify recognizes the underlying number, social security number or document number, and but somebody has, has put a new picture on it or a new name on it or something, they're not going to be able to catch that. So there are times when E-Verify uh, won't be able to catch those things. Um, a lot of people have found it to be a very useful um, system. As a reminder, it is not a replacement for the I-9. It is an addition to the I-9. So you complete the I-9 within your regular processing, and then the E-Verify has to also be completed within those three days of, of start date. Um, anecdotally, people have found it to be useful. It gives them a little bit of peace of mind. Now, a lot of the um, a lot of the discussion that people have with me is, well, I don't hire a lot of unauthorized workers, or I don't have you know a large number of people who are um, um, for nationals or things like that. And just as a reminder about what the I nine is as well, the I nine is. It has to, even if you know somebody's a U.S. citizen, they also have to prove to you that they are. So it's not either from the I-9 or not just to show that you're not hiring people who aren't supposed to be here. Um, so I don't I really don't like to say yes or no, as if E-Verify is recommended, if it's useful for you. Um, as we sit in New York State, it is not required for employers in New York State to be enrolled in E-Verify. Many, many states do. Um, and I don't, there haven't been any changes with that recently, but um, if you're not in New York State, you should check to make sure that uh, you are enrolled if you need to be. Certain federal contractors need to be enrolled in E-Verify, um, so there's some specific rules about who, uh, who needs to be enrolled and who doesn't need to be enrolled. Um, like I said, it does make people feel a little bit better. And if that's something that's, that's useful for you, it's a free system. Uh, all, all it takes is time. <laughs> So, um, you know, that's that's one thing um, that, that, you know, they're not charging you for it. Um, I will also mention that when you do sign up for E-Verify, there is a monitoring and compliance unit that monitors <laughs> all of the users for compliance. So that is not to say that you're going to be next on the list for an audit, um, but it does pull and aggregate your data and verify it and to and sort of like a credit card fraud unit would see um, if there's any weird activity going on. So I know that was a very lawyerly, wishy-washy explanation and answer to your question, but um, I it's it works for some people. It doesn't work for some people. Um, and I would be happy to talk to you about that offline about your particular workforce to see if that might be useful for you. <laughs> and it really is pretty quick, honestly. Within moments, it'll come back. This is a very nuanced question, but this has come up more recently um, than I ever would have thought. So temporary protected status. The government has issued what they call TPS, temporary protected status, for individuals from certain countries who are eligible to come to the United States because they are their countries are in um, bad shape. <laughs> um, so those countries include the Sudan, Haiti, um, El Salvador, um, there's a whole list and um, Honduras. 
So companies that have gone through severe economic depression, um, and so the United States is allowing those people under very specific circumstances to come to the United States and to be eligible for work. The confusing part about TPS is that when somebody initially comes to the United States and they get an EAD, an employment authorization document, it's valid for a finite period of time. That's normal. But then because of regulatory um, extensions, they um, just automatically extend its expiration. So someone could come to you and they would show you their temporary protected status EAD and it's expired, but you're still allowed to take it. So here's some... Um, Here's how you do it, and I'll show you a picture of what it looks like as well. So, their EAD is a section one doc, is a, a list A document. You're going to fill it out on the left there. Um, you're going to put the document number, the expiration date, and then as the second document, you're going to put temporary protected status or deferred enforced in part departure, auto extended EAD, um, and then the expiration of the automatically extended federally notice in the federal register. And then in the additional information field, you write section two EAD extended 1231-2022. So it's this is a very narrow situation, like I said, but I think you know you you may see this more often than you think. And I hope that and generally people who have TPS are understanding that their authorization has been automatically extended. Um, um, but if you do have any particular questions about this, definitely give me a call because there are um, specific codes on the EAD that you would that would note that, but they also generally know that no, it's been auto extended. So what you attach to this, if you're completing this for a first time employee, you attach their a copy of their EAD, even if it's expired. Then you attach a copy of the Federal Register, which is like 11 pages long. So it's clunky, but that's what you do. And then for an existing employee, so when someone's TPS expires, so on this. 1231.22, you're going to have to re-verify them. You would enter EAD extension along with the EAD automatic extension dates from the Federal Register. So it looks basically exactly like that again. Uh, but it would be, you know, whatever. It's usually in 18-month increments that they extend uh, extend the EAD. I don't know if anybody has had a TPS employee um, and how you've been handling that, but it can be a little tricky. Um, because it seems wrong, again, <laughs> that uh, an EAD is expired, but you're allowing somebody to work past the expiration date. But um, it's one of those things that it they wouldn't get a new, they could get a new EAD, but they generally aren't getting them in time. Um, and in my experience, in my experience, um, in my memory even, there has never been a time where they have ended TPS. Um, they tried and a couple times it gets close, but generally they're extending and they have added Nicaragua um, recently to the list. And I think there was another country that they added recently to the list as well. So um, it is not a path to permanent residence. It's not a permanent status. So um, these employees may not be employees of, of yours forever, but for a, an extended period of time, they're, they definitely are. And they're eligible to work in the United States in any capacity. VJ says they've been handling the same way. Yeah, you know, there's specific things you should and should not do on the on the I-9, as we all know. But when it comes to these kind of random situations, the document, 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 write all over it. Um, if someone changes their name and you don't feel like you need to redo their section three, just write their new name on the top of the form. It's not, you know, they're the same person. They haven't changed. You can update their I-9. You can re-verify, but you certainly don't have to. Um, but, you know, staple it all together. If you've got an electronic system, write it in the notes field so that you don't forget what happened and why it looks like that. So I'll, I'll let you think on this a second. If anybody has any other questions that, um, I haven't covered. Jill, I do, I will get you an example of how to review and document um, for the COVID uh, virtual verifications. Uh, while you're thinking, I just want to remind everybody that Paragon does offer other services. We have an, a very robust ACA compliance um, service as well as um, sexual harassment prevention at, for New York State, as well as diversity training, um, if anybody's interested in those. Um, we've been around for over 11 years now. We are, we're no longer babies. We're turning into teenagers. So 
um, I'm glad everybody got to join me today. Um, there's a, a million other questions <laughs> that could come up in the context of, of the I-9. Um, how far behind is ICE? That's a great question. Um, in terms of their audits, it <laughs> we have seen that they are now processing, they kind of paused their audits because um, during the pandemic, people, you know, they obviously weren't going into places, but um, they're starting to process things from probably six, eight months ago. That doesn't mean they're going to come with a decision anytime soon. And they, there's no, they have no deadline of when they have to respond to, to audits. Um, but generally you'll know, hopefully within a year, I know that's a terrible amount of time, but um, um, they, they try to respond to clear these things off their desk and they have, they have ramped up their, um, their auditors. So now that things are electronic too, that does make it a little bit easier. So um, they're not fast though. <laughs> they're not quick. Um, yeah, let's see. I think I got everybody's question except about the, uh, how to review the, the I-9 for, um, for COVID. Um, I'll put up my slide, my last slide. It's just me again. Um, if you want to jot down my email, or I think a lot of us are connected on LinkedIn, which is really great. But like I said, I do post a lot on there and um, hopefully talk about useful content. Um, and if you have any other questions that came up, please feel free to get in touch with me. I love to <laughs> think about these random things that come up. Um, there'll probably be a lot of other things that come up. Um, and as we I'll definitely keep you all updated about as we go along with the, the COVID verifications, what's really gonna happen. But if there's anything you learn from this, if you've done virtual verification, start as soon as you possibly can to get those documents verified in person. You know, if and if you've got a coworker or a colleague who you think could be pretty smart in this, <laughs> and I know that's not everybody, um, but if you've got somebody that you trust, maybe, you know, and you've got people in the office, start start by last name, start by first name, however you want to do it. But do a couple a day if you can. Set aside kind of an office hours type of situation where you say, okay, bring me your documents between this time and this time, and let's just let's just knock it out. Um, just think of it as a um, a, a verif re verification fair. Um, yes, a recording will be available probably later today once it all processes. And yes, the um, the PowerPoint will also be available to uh, to print. And I will also add in there uh, the questions that we asked if there was anything that wasn't included on there and the COVID-19 example so that you've got it all in one place. And if something doesn't make it into the recording or doesn't make it into the PowerPoint, just, just let me know. Well, I, I know we're a minute past 11, so I know people have got to get back to their, their lives, but I'll stay on a couple minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions. Um, but I thank you all for coming. Uh, it's always great to, to see familiar names and to get great questions. This is why we do it, because um, these things come up and people don't know what to do. <laughs> so I don't always know what to do either, but I certainly know where I can find the answers. So I appreciate everybody's time and uh, enjoy your, I guess it's Tuesday, enjoy your Tuesday. <laughs>